So here we go, trying to make sense of these passages. Let me see if I can find my sermon, first of all. There we go. So I realized that, I don't, does this feel rep repetitive to you? It, it feels to me like we keep banging our head against these same scriptures. That, that, I mean, it feels like I just, just preached on these scriptures a while ago. I don't, I don't know. Hopefully this is not true anyway. Um, but, but it's important that we keep banging our head against these scriptures because it's important to ground our faith in, in the actual text of the Bible and in the actual events of our world today, in our, of our lives today. And so that's what we're going to try to do this morning, just like we do every Sunday. One of the things you may have noticed about the Matthew passage is that the Gospels don't always portray God in a way that we are comfortable with. Right? This is, this is uh, right? God does things in, in the Matthew story, at least the king does things, and we presume that the king is God in, in, this, in this parable, or God is the king in this parable, and, and the king does some, some pretty nasty things to people. And so this is not the soft sort of pastel covered God of, of American pop culture. This is God with an edge. But again, this is Matthew trying to make sense of both his reality and God at the same time. And so, and, and he's quite convinced that Jesus also, right, did the same kind of thing that Jesus said, hey, look, there's God and then there's reality. And these two things have to fit together or else we're not really talking about, about God. So it's important to understand what's going on as best we can understand in Matthew's world that causes him to write his gospel in this way. And the first thing we need to understand is that Matthew is probably writing sometime after the destruction of Jerusalem, right? So in 70 CE, I'm going to try to share some screen here, see if I can, see if I can do this. Okay, in 70 CE, this, is, this was the temple. Where's the temple? There we go. So this is uh, actually like desktop size model of what somebody thinks the Jerusalem temple might have looked like. We don't have really any decent descriptions of what the building looked like. We've got a, a few things still standing today that may have been part of the temple, may not have been part of the temple. Right. But anyway, so this is somebody's best guess at what the temple looked like before it was destroyed in 70. And so there's the ancient city of Jerusalem in the background there. The whole city isn't very big. Um, you know, it's I think it's like a third of a square mile, something like that. Um, so so this is the temple. And, and it was uh, I mean, it, it was destroyed by the Romans. Partly in 70, and then they came back in 132 and then sort of finished it off. But this is a big thing. Now, now some people, right, that I mean thousands of people were slaughtered in that event, but some people managed to run away and they ran away to this place in Masada, right? And so, so this is like a back when Jesus was born, there was a king and whose name was Herod. And he was really significantly paranoid um, for lots of good reasons. Um, and so he built himself a, a tower, a palace up here. Um, so that's the Dead Sea in the background. And there's like not a plant that you can see anywhere around here. You could see, we, I've stood up the top and you can look for miles and miles and miles and not see a plant. Um, but he had a tower, he had a castle up there just to make sure he was had someplace to run. Um, when he needed to be safe um, and some, uh, he died. And so this place got abandoned. And then, and then a, a small Jewish group took over this after the destruction of the temple. And this was gonna be their last holdout. And the Romans also came and slaughtered everybody there after a sort of a longish kind of siege. Okay, so this is, this is what's going on in Matthew's world. Hang on here. And, and in the midst of all this, Matthew's part of this new Jesus movement thing, and they're this small and struggling group, and they can face continued opposition from Jesus' own people, from the, from the Jewish leaders, 
um, and from the Romans. And so there's lots of stuff happening in, in Matthew's world, and he's trying to make sense of this at the same time as proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah. And, and I think we don't have to necessarily like Matthew's answers, but we do need to appreciate his struggle. That this is, this is tough to figure out, right? It's kind of like today, right? I mean, look at what's happening with this whole pandemic. Where's, where's God in the pandemic? or in the election, right? And all of the stuff that's happening right now and is going to happen in the next few months, where is God in all of this, right? We do, this, these, are not easy, these are not easy questions. We don't even know how many of Jesus' followers were in Jerusalem when it was destroyed, or maybe there were even some in Qumran. But the bits of evidence we have suggested there really weren't a lot. Um, that somehow the, the Christian church had been warned to flee. And we see, we see this warning actually in, in Mark's gospel, um, to flee to the hills when stuff like this happens. Um, but, but still, right, all sorts of big stuff is happening. And I'm sure for lots of people in Matthew's community, it must have seemed like the end, the end of the world. Because in some ways, it was the end of a particular world. It was the end of the of Judaism as a sacrificing community, right? The whole thing, right? If you read Leviticus, right? Or Genesis or Exodus or Leviticus or like most of the Old Testament, the assumption is that Judaism is part of a sacrificing community. That sacrifice in the temple or at least somewhere is an important part of worshiping God. Um, and suddenly it's over. There is no more sacrifice going on in the temple. Happened, it just happened like daily for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years by that point. And so historians today talk about Second Temple Judaism, that it's a very clear ending date. And that's just happened for Matthew. Uh, and somewhere, he keeps saying, somewhere in this, God was. Right? Something died that day. It wasn't God. Um, but, but they had no way of knowing what was, what, um, what was going to follow. Now, some of you are more interested in history than I am. Um, and so I just wanted to throw in a historical note here to say that most of what we know about these events actually comes to us from a man named Josephus, um, who is the only person to have written about these events in any sort of contemporary, contemporaneous kind of way. And, and Josephus is notoriously unreliable. Um, and we know Josephus is unreliable because he wrote two accounts of this event and they're different. Um, so clearly at least one of them has to be wrong. And his numbers are always off by at least a factor of 10. Um, so for example, in the destruction of Jerusalem, he writes that a million people died in the destruction of Jerusalem. Well, you maybe will actually fit a million people in Jerusalem, but not if anybody actually wants to lie down to fall asleep. It's, you know, it's just like, no, this number is probably off by a factor of maybe a hundred or something like that. But the problem, historians have the problem of like, we've got one piece of evidence and it's wrong. Um, you know, so, so what do you do? So you can look at Wikipedia and Wikipedia mostly just follows Josephus because what else do you do? Anyway, so to get back to, back to our Matthew story. Our Matthew story wants to say that here's a parable about kind of what's going on. And the first interesting thing for me in this is that Matthew says that the, the message of the gospel is God's offer of a banquet. Right? This is God's, this is the message of the Jesus event is that this is God's, off, this is a party. This is not just good news. This is great news of a celebration. And it often feels weird to me Right, that, that this is our message and, and our response is to like have a church service. Um, you know, like if you've ever, like, like you know, if you, if you come to Ghana sometime, right, then you'd see, oh yeah, okay, this is a party. We're supposed to be having a party, right? And if you spend an hour or, or two dancing on Sunday morning, then you get a better sense that this is indeed a party and people wear their, their best clothes and they have a great time. Um, but we tend to like, like look, sit, sit around and, 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 you know, but anyway, right. The idea, this, this message that, that 
Matthew and that we continue to try to proclaim is meant to be like seriously good news of a celebration. The second thing that Matthew notices is that the leaders didn't respond well. Right? The, that the, the message of Jesus was rejected by the leaders of his own community. Um, and that, that this rejection included the persecution of the messengers. Right? So, so God sends out this message with, that there's a, there's a party. And not only did the people not come to the party, the leaders not come to the party, um, but, but they persecuted the messengers which is just a weird thing, right? Imagine someone comes and invites you to a party and you beat them up. Right? And so Matthew's just trying to figure out like, why would, why would somebody do this? Did we, did we just really say it wrong or what's going on, right? And Matthew also proclaims that the result of all this is the destruction of Jerusalem. Wow. That's a hard one. How do we think about like, did God really destroy Jerusalem because he was mad that the people didn't accept Jesus? <clears throat> I don't believe that. I think Matthew just got this one wrong. Um, <clears throat> but still, right, he is, he's doing something that's hard. He's doing something that's hard of saying, how do I make sense of right, Jerusalem being destroyed and God at the same time? <clears throat> Another interesting part, Mike, by the way, if you kiss you one day, I'm not going to solve this one for you <laughs> because there is no solution to this one, right? I mean, there's just, there's just the ongoing question. But one of the interesting things that, that, that we see also as we go on here is Matthew's characterization of the early church, those that do come, right? It's, it's the riffraff. It's the both the good and the bad. Matthew doesn't think about the church as the collection of the good people or the best people or even the decent people. It's like, well, some of them were good and some of them were bad. <clears throat> Everybody got invited. Whoever showed up, right? That, that was, right? That was the way, that was the way the church was. That's the way the church is. Except for this one dude who doesn't realize he's supposed to be at a party, right? And and I'm glad that Rachel spent some time this morning in the children's story wrestling with that, with that idea, because honestly, I don't know what to do with it. That I looked at this and I, over and over again this week, and I thought like, what, what's the message there? Right? And, so, right? and so I really liked Rachel's way of, of, of thinking about this, that, that you know, we're supposed to be ready. We're supposed to, you know, and maybe how we're dressed isn't as important, right? But how we think about things, I don't know. So what do we learn from all of this? Well, one thing we learn is that even the temple of God in Jerusalem and the city of Jerusalem, God's holy city, got destroyed. And if we know our history, we know that the temple was destroyed twice and Jerusalem has been overrun more times than we can count. So even these things, God says, are not worth saving. They're just stuff, right? And stuff is just stuff. And yes, people died in these events. And yes, somehow God was present. And, and, right? and we, we have to hang on to that right now, right? That no, I don't think God sent this pandemic to teach us a lesson but there's a lesson to be learned here anyway. And yes, God is somehow present with us and with the rest of the world right now. And no, I don't think God sent Donald Trump to teach us a lesson, but there's a lesson to be learned here, right? And, and so we should learn the lesson, whatever it happens to be, right? Because otherwise this whole thing's been a waste of time. It's always difficult, if not impossible, to interpret the times while things are happening. It's always easier to do in hindsight. But it's more important, I think, to focus on the new future. Right? Don't worry about the past. The past happened, what, and, and we're never going to go back there. The question is now, what are we building? But again, to come back to where we started, this is supposed to be a celebration. There's hard times, 
It's hard to celebrate during the hard time. And Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Like Paul, who is in jail, <clears throat> says, rejoice in the Lord always. And this is one of my, my favorite pieces of Paul. We don't, we don't do a lot of Paul here necessarily um, because, well, you know, Paul is still Paul at the end of the day. Um, but, but when he gets something right, he gets something right. And I know that this isn't the church that spends a lot of energy necessarily memorizing scripture, but if you're going to do it, this is a good place to start, right? Philippians chapter 4, starting at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be made known to everybody the Lord is near. Do not worry about anything. My goodness, how many times a day should you say this to yourself? Really? I mean, just over and over again, this thing has to be coming up. Because this is, this is a survival guide. This is just Paul's little, little gem to us. Although here's a survival guide for the next few weeks. So I would encourage you to read this every morning, right? To, to memorize it, to, to keep it with you. Um, not because it makes such a great sermon, because it makes such a great guide for your day. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let your gentleness be made note to anyone. Do not worry about anything. Right? Make your requests known to God. So, right, this is the struggle. This is the struggle of integrating our faith and the COVID election we're in the middle of. And the struggle is not going to go away because, you know, once the election is over, something else is going to happen. And even if we solve the pandemic, something else is going to happen. We continue with this struggle. We continue with this struggle together. We continue this struggle together with God. It's not going away. Um, so we continue to rejoice, party as often as we can. Do not worry about anything. Amen. So we want to have another break.